something was going to happen. Something wonderful. G'day fans <laughs> and welcome to another exciting Wednesday night stuck at home isolation central uh, to uh, talk nerdy to me as I speak clearly people are stuck at home because they're signing in already how good is that Michelle is joining us absolutely fantastic and it's uh, uh, going to be a very very special show tonight with everybody five, five people already we're less than two oh my god they're rolling in like oranges Anyway, so g'day, Carol from Ballarat, who's enjoying a bit of more freedom than we've got here in Melbourne. So g'day, Greg, as well. Um, tonight is a very, very special show, as they always are. And with me, of course, I'm with my two excellent lads, MPS and Jeffro. How are we tonight? Very good. Yeah, good, good. All right, so we've actually got a couple of presentations. We're going to kick this one right off. And this is something that um, Jeffro brought up. So, Jeffro, I'm going to pass over to you. I'm going to get some pictures up in a second, and we can go from there. So uh, away you go, sir. Yeah, certainly. So we were looking at um, uh, examples where there was a animated series and then sort of uh, years down the track, uh, we suddenly saw some bright executive in Hollywood sort of say, well, let's do a, uh, a movie and uh, make it a live action movie. So uh, when you sort of think about it, you think, well, I can think of a few examples, but when you actually delve really deep into it, there's actually more than you uh, realise. So um, the first one we had was um, Elvin and the uh, Chipmunks. Now, uh, I remember watching this as a kid and absolutely loving it. So, I mean, Elvin's been around since the uh, the 60s and all that. So, uh, and here we sort of saw in the last uh, five years or so, a uh, the fact that uh, we now can do uh, the CG work that we do. Uh, Alvin um, um, mixing it up sort of in the uh, the live world. So uh, that um, you would almost think who would have ever thought that Alvin would still be relevant considering it's like a 50-year-old cartoon, but someone did. So Alvin the Chipmunks is our first one. Um, before, I go any further, sorry, before I go any further, you are right, Michelle. Yes, we did actually lose uh, Kelly uh, Preston as well. Uh, so, yes, it's been a double whammy for uh, celebrities uh, this week. So, But Grant is the one we, we were sort of a bit more, I guess, associated with the whole science fiction um, pop culture um, genre, I guess. So, sorry, Jeffro, continue on. That's right. Uh, so the next one we have, again, is sort of um, delving back to those um, middle 50s. So... Uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost actually started off as a, um, a comic in Harvey's comics and then sort of quickly progressed to uh, an animated series. And, um, again, another one that I really loved. Who would have ever thought that they would have resurrected it? Uh, I mean, in the – I think it was the 70s we had a cartoon called Casper and the Angels and then sort of we didn't hear anything after that. But uh, in – I think it was – 2005 or thereabouts, someone can correct me on that one, we saw this um, uh, live-action movie with Christina Ricci and um, and a CGI Casper. And, I mean, I, I love Christina Ricci, I love Casper, but for me, I saw it at the time and said, nah, that's done with it, not a great movie. So, Do you reckon uh, they uh, made this purely because they could digitise Casper? I mean, without the digital CGI, I think they, you reckon they would have even bothered. They said, oh, now we can do a, a, a digital ghost that you can actually see through. And how good is that? I, so, I would absolutely uh, definitely think that was the case. So uh, uh, every now and then there's sort of like a supernatural craze and all that. Maybe they just felt that um, it was time to sort of uh, see if they can get some of that Ghostbusters audience which or the kids' audience. But uh, I don't know who the audience was for this one. So I, I think it tanked. Now, uh, a lot of people may remember from the um, uh, the Rocky and Bullwinkle uh, stable, uh, Dudley Do-Right. So he actually appeared in a short little eight-minute cartoon that was sort of uh, uh, his segment along with other things like Tom Slick and Super Chicken. So uh, here we were out of the blue in uh, 1999 suddenly seeing Brendan Fraser playing the live-action version of um, Dudley Do-Right. So... I guess for a lot of us people that saw the original cartoon and we loved the uh, uh, the, the 
the humor, which was very uh, sort of um, uh, clever human, clever humor, I should say, that um, when we saw the movie, it didn't quite sort of have the same kind of humor and it was like a very high bar that they needed to sort of get to. And unfortunately for me, at least, uh, it, it didn't succeed. Flintstones, meet the Flintstones. They're a modern Stone Age family. So, of course, we all remember the 60s um, uh, cartoon. And as we know, Steven Spielberg decided to uh, give it a crack in 1994. I didn't mind it. And I think the reason why I liked it is because they cast it really well. And uh, I did love the, uh, the the CG work that they had in there. So uh, uh, not everyone would like it, uh, I guess, for me, as I said, the the casting and just the personalities uh, really sort of brought to life were um, for me sort of something that meant I could watch that. And they obviously did well enough to make a, a sequel. So we saw Viva Rock Vegas, uh, which was I think actually one of those few sequels that's better than the uh, the original. I, me at least, I like the uh, the sequel more so. so what do you think about the fact that with the sequel, like none of the main cast returned, did they? It was all they had to recast everybody. Is that right? Yeah, that's pretty much the case. So, uh, I mean, the um, the actors that they got in the first one were really A list actors. Um, and you can see John Goodman, Rick Moranis uh, there. Uh, but I I thought, you know, even though it was like the B team that came in to do the the sequel, they gave it their A game. So. For that, um, I appreciated uh, what they did and I enjoyed it. Very cool. G.I. Joe. Well, not much I can say about G.I. Joe. Um, it It is what it is. Um, do you have anything, MPS, that you want to say about uh, G.I. Joe? Look, I, the, the movies, because there's two and I think there's a third one sort of coming. Um, yeah, this was a... Look, to be honest, I don't think the cartoon was that great either back when it kicked in the 80s because there was a bunch of these cartoons that came out uh, around the 80s and this was one of them. Uh, yeah, I think the movies are a little bit better. Uh, they're, they're, I don't know what the term is, but they're, they're certainly not for a, a kid sort of base audience, if that makes sense, but they are at the same time because it's just action, 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 more so than anything else. Um, but, yeah, other than that, not a, not a lot with the Joes, really. I like um, how it says there, G.I. Joe, a real American hero. It's just like, who are they having to dig at? Because it's like, oh, what, the, what are there fake American heroes out there, are they? So uh, it's almost like they're uh, having a swipe at somebody. So Well, the funny part is there's, there's no one actually called Joe in there. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got Snake Eyes, you've got... Um, uh, Psych, uh, you got all these other characters, but there's no one called Joe there. I, I love it. As is often the case in a lot of these shows, um, all the, the, the dudes are wearing all their armor and whatever, and yet the woman is effectively wearing a one piece bathing suit. You know, I mean, she's got coverings underneath, but still, um, they couldn't give her armor and stuff as well, could they? So, yeah, it's very typical in a lot of ways. So, there you go. Very good. Next one, Jeffro. Yeah, and the, uh, the next one we have is George of the Jungle. So everyone sing, George, George, George of the jungle, strong as you can be. Oh, 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 oh. watch out for that tree. <clears throat> so uh, <laughs> it's, it's again, from the uh, same stable as uh, Dudley Do-Right. And uh, it's, I think, with this one, whereas Dudley Do-Right wasn't a great success, I think Brendan Fraser really tapped into his George on this one. And um, if my memory serves me, and correct me if I'm wrong, and people will out there, uh, they had John Cleese playing the uh, the voice of the ape. And uh, that just, uh, with uh, Cleese's comic timing and all that, just really made the, uh, the two of them a really good uh, combination. So for that one, I give that a, a thumbs up. So is there any point where the ape just goes, Manuel, Manuel? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> when George hits the hits the tree, does he say, "How do you feel?" George says, "Better." Um, is that the kid from Two and a Half Men? I'm not too sure if it's the kid uh, from Two and a Half Men. Which which role is that? The kid that's in the picture there. Oh no no no! That's okay. He looks not, like the kid. Not, not, 
Not that I could say yay or nay. I, I wouldn't have thought so, but uh, someone might have to check IMDb on that one. So uh, I'll um, good on you, Colin. I'll, I'll pass on that one. Very good. Okay. But uh, yeah, good old Brendan's. Uh, yeah, he got a bit of a repertoire of doing uh, comic characters and films, eh? So, uh, but uh, good on him too. There you go. This one I haven't heard of before, Jeffro. So you've sort of threw me off on this one. Yeah. Now this this one was one of those cartoons that. Um, came out that because I'm a guy, I didn't really watch myself. Uh, and, I mean, we had seen success in the uh, the past with Josie and the Pussycats, which is uh, the next slide we have because I'm doing an alphabetical order. So I guess they were looking at trying to be able to sort of get something where there's an all-female band and, you know, girl power and such because, I mean, obviously the Spice Girls were uh, uh, big and such. So this was... Uh, also primarily a real marketing campaign to sort of flog toys, you know, Gem and the Hologram toys, and and it's a bit like uh, G.I. Joe and um, He-Man and such. There was a, quite a considerable toy line. And uh, we did actually see uh, a live-action version of uh, this one in 2015, and, boy, did it sink without a trace. <laughs> it got uh, – if, if you ever get to check the Rotten Tomatoes um, – uh, rating on this one, you'll find that it's really ground level, that movie. So, um, yeah, it's like it wasn't a great cartoon, but it was even worse in a live action format. As I say, the only gem that I know of is the gem Hadar from D Space Nine, but uh, we move on, shall well, we? In actual, fact, in actual fact, if we can go back, please. Uh, in actual fact, Gem and the uh, um, holograms were up against Barbie and the Rockers. So oh, they were, yeah. They were. Barbie had a cartoon at that stage, and I don't know which one came first. They were up against each other on Saturday morning television. You basically had, like, Transformers, G.I. Joe, Barbie and the Rockers, Gem and the Holograms, and then you went back to, you know, other sort of shows. But they were up against each other back in the 80s. Golly. And there's no Barbie live-action movie, is there? Give it time. Um, I did hear something in the works. Yeah, very good. And, and now, of course, we've got uh, Josie and the Pussycats. So a um, uh, big one from the Hanna-Barbera staple from the uh, uh, the 60s. Uh, really enjoyed it. And I think the good thing about um, the cartoon is that they had uh, uh, a good supporting cast of um, other characters other than the band itself. Uh, and here we are in sort of uh, 2001 uh, doing a, a live-action um, uh, remake. Uh, again, like the Gem movie, uh, did not uh, succeed at all. I think the fans didn't like the fact that, you know, all the other great supporting characters uh, like Sebastian and the Cat and all that weren't there. It was just primarily the uh, uh, the actors. And, yeah, it just, it just it felt like a cash-in. It was a cash-in and nobody likes a cheap cash-in. Um, yeah, uh, Angus T. Jones was the name of the uh, the, the, the dude. Yeah, okay, that was it. That was the kid from Two and a Half Men. Um, I would have loved to have seen this do really well because I would have loved to have seen the sequel, Josie and the Pussycats in Outer Space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, right. would have been awesome. that would have been an awesome film. Um, I like the fact that in the live-action movie, the girls never wore the outfits in the cartoon that we're seeing here, the leopard spin. They just didn't wear that at all, if I recall. So, uh, And I actually saw Josie and the Pussycats, and I actually thought it was quite a good film. Uh, and I like the idea, and I think we've discussed this on the show before, how, and it's actually a little bit real life how... Um, music band producers uh, can like artificially create a band, and if they get if the band gets too big for their boots, which is what happens at the start of the film, they just sort of push them away somewhere, and then just recreate a brand new band to replace them, and then the cycle repeats itself. And of course, the ego of the band thinks, "Oh, we're great and fantastic and wonderful," not realizing that it's the producers, the music producers, who actually make them as famous as they are. So there's definitely a message in that for everybody. But uh, yeah, I got to admit, I didn't mind Josie and the Pussycats. There's a great scene in the film, though, if you remember this. They're on the stage. Josie's on the stage of the band. There's a huge concert, and the guy she likes is in the oil, in the crowd somewhere, and they're yelling out to each other, oh, I love you, it's all fantastic, it's wonderful. And, of course, in real life, when they're, then when there's a 10,000 billion people there, there's no way in the world they'd be able to hear each other. But in the movie they do, and it's like, oh, this is suspension of reality <laughs> for you. So, uh, yeah, he's calling out from the crowd, and she's hearing everything he's saying. He's like, yeah, I don't think so. So uh, there you go. And, yes, you're right, Daniel, there's some good uh, music in it as well. So there you go. Uh, there is a Barbie movie coming out. Well, I'm not surprised by that at all. So there you go. Keep your eyes open for that. Oh, here we go. Here's a good one. Here's a good one for uh, Pete. I'll let you have this one. Oh, I don't because I 
Look, I love the TV series. Um, the movie has some good elements in it. I'm not the biggest fan. Dag's actually more of a fan of this one. Um, but, yeah, uh, I, I've got a comment which I'll make later on about those and a few bit, other bits and pieces. The only problem I had with this mostly was the fact that the costumes weren't the same. I didn't care the fact that he didn't... Um, uh, he didn't transform either. That bugged me to the to the most point because he's meant to transform. You know, mm. I didn't mind the fact it was set on Earth. You know, that was nice. You know, Courtney Cox and and um, uh, she she played her role and and um, uh, what's his name? Who was Dolph who was? Lundgren. No, not Dolph Lundgren. He was oh boy, he was terrible. Um, <laughs> He's going to be stiffer than Ken in a Barbie film. Um, <laughs> Frank Langella. Frank Langella was brilliant. Yeah, Frank Langella. Yes, who played um, no. Maddie. You could have just asked yeah. me. I would have told you who played Skeletor. Jeez, guys. <laughs> no, no. What's the thing with Skeletor? I was thinking of the uh, what's his name that's sitting in the front there that's on Voyager. Oh yeah, um, yeah him. Um, Robbie. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Robert, Robert Duncan yeah. McNeil. Yeah, who's gone on to far bigger and better things, and and you know the four main actors in the film actually have done big stuff since then you know so uh but yeah not not close enough to uh the cartoon in many respects for me it's one of those things where the film may have done better if the cartoon never existed because you are right nps there was a lot of comparison between the film and the cartoon series and the fact they like kept he-man looking the way he's meant to we are admittedly Dolph couldn't act to save his life but with Skeletor, they completely changed his design for whatever reason, and I guess that would have upset a lot of the fans no matter what because it's like, hang on, that's not how Skeletor's meant to be. But I, it worked for me because I really liked the way Skeletor was portrayed, uh, the way the environment was portrayed. Uh, the fact that they brought it to Earth was great. It's very funny. Like, Skeletor's forces arrive with 10,000 bad dudes in this country town and not a single person sees them. I mean, that's just, just fantastic. Obviously, the whole town was in self-isolation at that point because no one was out of their houses at all, no cars, nothing. So I thought that was actually quite funny. Um, but I actually uh, found it quite enjoyable, and I really like Skeletor's relationship with Evil Lynn. That just sort of worked for me. So I have no idea. I've never seen the cartoon, but the film uh, did push my buttons. So uh, there you go. And Ange agrees with me. So there you go. Very, very cool. Uh, yeah, Tom Paris is a character on Voyager. So there you go. The way that they could relate it back to coming to Earth was, in fact, in the cartoon, He-Man's mother is Earth, is an Earthling. Um, no, she think. flies off from Earth. She's an astronaut. She gets caught in a, a, a black hole and gets sent over to, you know, to where Eternia is. Um, the costume is not a big deal, but the fact that the sword wasn't pronounced enough and should have had the design, and the fact that he uses a gun, you know, two are things that didn't happen in the cartoon. So. Right. And they've been trying to make a, a remake of this film for the last 15 years and it's just, it comes and goes every couple of years and I, I don't know if it's going to be any good, to be honest with you. Yeah, oh, plus the other thing too is they're going to cast He-Man. I mean, the options would have been pretty limited at the time because you need a big guy to do it and I guess Dolph was the closest they could get and it is what it is. But if you look at the end credits, he had a dialogue coach, he had an acting coach, yeah. he had coach everything but anyway we move on so uh there you go so it didn't rate well for mps but it rated well for me so and and just and as well which is kind of cool all right yes the uh the next one is the classic um animated series popeye and i mean popeye is huge i mean you couldn't get uh a bigger cartoon character much loved has been around for ages but in um i think it was 1980 i could be wrong uh yeah 1980 uh, they decided to give Robin Williams a crack at playing Popeye. And I um, I thought he was really good. He does a fantastic impersonation as uh, of Popeye. I mean, he's got the charisma and all that. But, you know, one man cannot hold a movie. And I think most people just thought, why the heck are they making this movie? Who wants to see a Popeye movie? And eventually... Everyone said, well, we don't, and it really sunk without a trace. So, I mean, it's great as a tour de force for Robin Williams fans, but as a, as a movie itself, uh, I just don't think it was the right time and the right place, and it sort of got the Howard the Duck treatment. Mm. It's very funny. I just remember one of the lines. I, I mean, I saw it in the cinema, and I didn't think it was very good, but I just remember the one line when he gets introduced to olive oil and he just mutters under his breath, you know, it sounds like a lubricant. I always thought that was actually quite funny. Um, uh, MPS this is one for you. You're going to have a bit of a fight with Ange over this one. Uh, apparently, yeah. he uses a gun in the cartoon. So, yeah. 
I'm but not sure. I, I I don't remember. I don't recall him using a gun, but anyway, we'll continue on. We will indeed. That's a discussion for another day. So there you go. All right. Next one, again, from that uh, that stable, uh, Dudley Do-Right and uh, George of the Jungle and all that, is, of course, Rocky and Bullwinkle. So uh, uh, this one I really loved. I think that, uh, again, it comes down to the, uh, the casting. Uh, you've got um, George Alexander there playing uh, Boris Badenort, uh, Robert uh, De Niro playing um, the uh, evil leader, I mean, that was a freak out just to be able to see him actually playing that part. You would think, you know, how did they score him? And the um, the animation of the um, Rocky Bull Bullwinkle was really seamless. And the, the the guy that did the voices is an Australian called Keith Scott, and he nails it. He he's really good, and uh, and it had all that humour that you would expect. Uh, to, to see, and uh, it's a bit like Looney Tunes back in action when they did that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, in-jokes and subversive jokes and all that, so this one I really liked. Cool. The, uh, of course, Scooby-Doo. Here we are in uh, 2002, and we saw the uh, the live-action version of this one. Uh, this one was written by James Gunn, who, of course, later on wrote Guardians of the Galaxy, and... Uh, his humour is really good, and uh, and I think this could have been a real miss, but um, I really enjoyed it. I thought that um, the actors that they got were uh, really good. Of course, we had the um, uh, the role of Michelle Gellar sort of uh, playing um, uh, Daphne, and that was a bit weird because essentially she was the biggest cast person at the time, yet she's playing a minor role. So that was really weird. But, uh, uh, and, of course, Matthew Lillard, who uh, you can see uh, there in the live-action um, uh, Shaggy, he certainly uh, ran with that one because all the subsequent uh, cartoons that they did, he actually did the voice of Shaggy. So he's been doing Shaggy voices for about the next, for the last 15 years. So uh, he's done really well out of this one. Yeah, I thought of the, of the group, Freddie Prinze was actually the weakest of the characters. So... Um... Mm. And, and, of course, everything hinged on the fact that they had to CG the dog, and if the dog didn't work, the whole film was completely shot, and you had mm. to believe, yes, the dog is actually there and Shaggy's interacting with him and all the rest of it, and it actually worked out quite well. So, uh, um, yeah, I think they it was almost a bit of a get-out-of-jail-free card on this one, and uh, it actually worked out uh, quite well. So there you go. And for those of you that, are rem that do remember when this was shot, it was shot up in, in the Gold Coast. Coast. Yep, mm. that's right. Yeah, and, and actually, uh, Sarah Michelle was doing Buffy at the time, and she was flying between America and Australia because she was doing both at the same time. It's like I don't know how she would stay awake, but uh, yeah, it was a uh, pretty impressive stuff. But um, yeah, no, very good. Of course, we have uh, the Smurfs. So again, one of those huge franchises that came out of the uh, the, the seventies and sort of spilled out into the eighties disappeared for a time, and next thing you know, we're doing a um, a live action uh, version in. Uh, uh, it was, it was, this one's fairly recent, uh, in the last five years or so. So they managed to make this and um, also a few sequels out of it. I mean, I enjoyed it for what it is. I'm not a big Smurf fan, but, I mean, it's um, it was light, it was fluffy, it had some good gags. Uh, I wouldn't go out and sort of pay good money to see it, but if it's on uh, Netflix, I'd watch it. Very good. Oh, yeah, Susie didn't like it, so there you go. So, yeah, not everybody was a fan, so there you go. Speed Racer. Now, Speed Racer is uh, very close to my heart, so I'm a huge Speed Racer fan. And uh, with the uh, the movie, you would always think, well, no, nah, they're not going to uh, not going to impress me. But boy, did they ever impress me! Because I just thought that uh, they loved that cartoon so much that they put everything that they possibly could to make it reasonably faithful and and take the spirit of the characters and uh, and do something that looked awesome on the big screen. So as I said, it was, I didn't think I was going to like it, but I walked out of the cinema absolutely loving it and uh, uh, made by the Wachowski brothers who uh, made The Matrix. So it's like sort of you just wouldn't think that they would go in that direction. But, um, yeah, I mean, maybe other people don't like it so much, but I, as a, a classic cartoon fan, 
uh, did love this this adaption. There you go. And um, Ads agrees with you as well. So there you go. And yes, yes Daniel, there were a lot of colours indeed. So there you go. Speaking of Yogi Bear, Susie, here's one for you. Hey, hey it's Yogi Bear. So uh, uh, again, sort of delving really deep into, I mean, Yogi Bear goes back to the uh, the 50s, one of the first Hanna-Barbera um, characters. So, the, I mean, he's been around at least um, on and off over the uh, the decades. So they would bring him back in the 70s and 80s uh, in things like Laugh Olympics and all, uh, a lot of other different sort of Hanna-Barbera uh, spin-off type shows. And um, here we are seeing a, um, a bit like the way Scooby-Doo and all those ones where it's like it's an animated animal in a, a live action world. And I enjoyed the laughs. I, um, I really enjoyed the um, just it was just like watching a live action cartoon, which is what you really hope for. And uh, I really enjoyed this one and um, rushed out to buy the, uh, the Blu-ray when it came out. So uh, this one gave me uh, a lot of enjoyment and a big thumbs up. Very See, for me, Yogi Bear doesn't look right. He looks too skinny. He does look skinny, I know, but um, yeah. I... Boo Boo looks I, fine, but Yogi just looks a little bit wrong. Mm. I, I sort of look past that, but, I, yeah, I can appreciate the fact that, yeah, he, um, he, he did sort of look a bit uh, emancipated. Very cool. Now, MPS, I think you said you had a couple that you wanted to bring up. Is that right? Yeah, I do. Um couple that I, I loved uh, as cartoons that didn't, and this is the problem I have with most of these films, they don't do justice to the source material, you know. So Inspector Gadget, you know, they did two live action films of that and nowhere near as good as the cartoon series with um, uh, Adam, uh, no, Adam. Don Adams. Don Adams, yes, thank you, uh, doing the voice of, of Inspector Gadget. That was far superior. Um, and I don't even think they had Penny in one of them. If I, I don't recall seeing the second one, but I think they changed the actors as well. I think Matthew Broderick did the first one, and then they brought the guy from Third Rock and the Sun. That's um, right. Yeah. In there. Uh, the other one, um, which was very disappointing, which was Gotcha Man, which was the Battle of the Planets and a, a oh. live action. It came out in 2013, and the cartoon that's had many different versions from the 70s through to the to the early 2000s um but this movie was actually quite disappointing the costumes didn't look close enough uh, the characters weren't the same and the storyline went in some sort of weird angle uh, so i again another one that didn't sort of follow the source material uh in that respect um one that i know that should have been awesome but it just was too kiddy was thunderbirds you know, I know we're talking animated, but Thunderbirds being the puppet series doesn't matter. Uh, the film was just needed to be a fraction more adult and the, the cast had to be a fraction older, um, and then that would have been fine, apart from the fact that I think Thunderbird 2 looked terrible because it wasn't the original dome shape. The rest were all fine, but that when you've got an icon, you've got to keep the icon. That way it stays with something of, of the original. Once you start redesigning stuff like that, you lose the flavour of what, what's there. Uh, the other one, too, which should have been awesome, uh, but eventually did become better, was Transformers. Transformers has five different films, and then you've got Bumblebee, and Bumblebee, I think, is far better than the actual Transformers because it's not as convoluted in its in their transformation from vehicle to, to robots. Uh, and the... Look, I know the cartoons were very simplistic, um, better than Machine Men, but, you know, still simplistic in itself. Uh, but the movies are just too convoluted and I think too um, war-orientated. Uh, so, um, and two that I haven't seen, but I know they made into films. One was Garfield, the other one was Paddington Bear. And I love oh, Paddington I've Bear. Seen those. I love Paddington Bear. Would always wanted one, but never got one. And Garfield, who doesn't love a cat that eats lasagna? Um, mm. But you know, again, two other films that relied on on CGI for the animals. Yeah. So if you, I'd say, do yourself a favor, go see uh, the Paddington movies. They are charming and lovely, and um, I haven't heard anyone say a bad thing about them. So uh, do yourself a favor and see that. The Garfield ones, not too bad as well. Um, 
I've enjoyed them. It's got Bill Murray doing the voice of Garfield, and uh, yeah, <laughs> hearing Bill Murray is just uh, is good enough for me. And um, that they're fun. Uh, he's he's done a couple of those, and um, not as good as Paddington. That one you definitely have to see. Yeah, fair enough. And that's my list. Very good. So I guess in the end, it does show that not all cartoons translate well to live action, but with the advent of CGI, it has certainly helped a lot and it makes them a lot, little bit more believable uh, when they're on screen. But uh, yes, you are correct, lads. It all still comes down to the storyline uh, and as to whether they can hold their weight. And uh, a few people have said that, uh, yes, they did like Garfield uh, and Bumblebee and yeah, how disappointing Thunderbirds was, and it was very disappointing mm -hmm. uh, after the large build-up. And um, there you go. And hello to Joe, who's in hospital at the moment. And uh, Tintin, actually. Ed, so I'll chuck in the Tintin one. Oh, um, yeah. and of course, Tintin wasn't live action as such. It was just a cartoon that was from a comic to a cartoon to a CG film. But as a CG film, it was very well done. And I think that the fact that they did a CG and not live action actually worked for it. So uh, uh, I think there was a live action done in the 90s. Yeah. Mm. Like that. Same with Asterix. Asterix also had the same thing. Um, uh, there were several animated and, and live action films. Cool. But the key thing we're waiting for now is definitely the Barbie movie. And who's going to get cast as Barbie? Won't that be the uh, highlight of that actress's life, whoever that happens to be? Very, very good. All right. Uh, all right. So we'll leave you to it. And remember, see you next week for some Star Wars talking. And we will, uh, in, the, in, the in the interim, make sure you stay nerdy. Okay. All right.